Hi, Greg. How you doing? Good. How are you? I'm well because it's the end of the day, so I've had the whole day here in the UK to prepare for this. But you are on the glorious West Coast, I, I believe, and the price you pay for that is it is the morning. It is the morning, but it's uh, it's okay. I wake up early usually, anyway. So, what does the uh, typical day start like? Uh, you know, it's all kind of all over the place. Like I have. I have some clients who are in New York and uh, London, so I kind of shift my schedule a little bit earlier when that happens. So I, I kind of yeah. just my schedule around depending on who I'm dealing with. So I'm kind of on the earlier side right now anyway. So You're currently like, doing a project that requires you to be on an earlier schedule. Kind of, yeah. Like yesterday, I woke up at uh, 7 and then started... Uh, Going over mixed notes at 8 a.m. my time, so. Yeah, 6 a.m. No, 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 8 a.m., Jesus, no, not 6 a.m., 8 a.m. my time. Very good. <laughs> so it's the, um, as consumers of mixed content, you know, people who watch mixed tutorials, and that's kind of how me and my colleagues uh, sort of got started in our careers. You know, we're basically digital natives, you, you know, YouTube and Mix of the Masters is our, our education, and um, almost all of that is pop music focused yeah. and yeah, very short form, traditional arrangements. And you're in the world of film score mixing, aren't you? That's your, that's your, that's your my, lane. My, yeah, my odd niche. Yeah. yeah. Although you know, I, I'm doing other things too, but that's, yeah, that's kind of what I end up becoming known for most of the time. What kind yeah. of other stuff are you doing? Um, you know, I, I do records too. So, you know, I've worked, I've worked with some bands, uh, some pop, pop artists um uh working with one right now um uh sophia isabella and she's you know she's really big on tiktok i don't even know what tiktok is you know but, but she's uh <laughs> she's well known and uh at least in that world and um and it's very different from what i'm doing in my film score world but you know this this i'm doing a lot of stuff like i'm mixing the sweeney todd Broadway cast album with Josh Groban right now. So no way. Uh, yeah. <laughs> so, uh, and actually, um, I got some of my early stuff was like, I, I did, um, I did, uh, Ox, I worked on the oxymoron record with uh, schoolboy Q. Yeah. Uh, you know, and I've worked with some hip hop artists too. So, uh, I have, I have a varied history actually of different things I've done. How do you go about look when you're working in a demanding domain like film where the 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 project timelines are going to be pretty long I I suspect although I don't know what the typical project is like why don't we why don't we start with that you know what because I work in uh, the in a in a small scale parody of what you work in which is advertising music in the UK so we all pretend we're making movies but they're all 30 seconds long and yeah. so uh, what's the workflow like when you're mixing a film score when does when does it what's the earliest sign of a project beginning is it an email or does someone you know how does it work how does it begin yeah an email usually or or a phone call but but the the schedules on on films are really different than on working on records. And in fact, I'd say it's probably the biggest factor to consider um, most of the time is is what the deadline is and working backwards from that. Yeah. Um, you know, uh, there's so many things that I think when you're working on records, I mean, that's, that's where I started out was working on records. So, you yeah. know, when we would take a song and, you know, start mixing it, we would give ourselves time to do a first draft, maybe park it for a few days, come back to it later, send it out to people, see what everybody thought, you know, get some collective, you know, consult and, and dive back in. And when, when you're doing a film, it, there's a lot of, there's a lot of what we call pre-dubs, which are people mixing the various aspects of the film independently and then sending that to one final mix. So it's almost like if you were to have somebody who's just in charge of mixing the drums and somebody who's in charge of mixing the keyboards and guitars and then somebody who's in charge of mixing the vocals in the um, in the interest of time and being organized enough to do that type of operation, 
just becomes a different skill set, you know. Um, so with music and film, you know, we are feeding another mix. We're feeding a mix that then becomes a mix of not only the music that I've mixed and finished, but then now the dialogue and also the effects and putting all that together. So we have to meet these deadlines very strictly. Uh, the dub stages and the mixers and post supervisors and everybody who's on these stages cost many thousands of dollars uh, a day. And, you know, if, if I don't deliver my music by 9 a.m. on Monday morning, um, you know, you kind of don't have a job anymore. I mean, that really is the, that really is like the most important factor. And, um, so how you mix and what you do and all that stuff kind of falls behind that in terms of importance. So yeah, you get an email, you get a call. And then, you know, the first question is always, what's the deadline? You know, when, when does this need to be delivered? And then everything else sort of works backwards from that. And is the deadline unpleasantly variable? Sometimes it's like, good news, you got two years. And then sometimes it's yep. like, this is dropping in two weeks. We need it done yep. like by Wednesday. Yep, absolutely. Um, video games are kind of cool in that regard because video games are not usually as strict, mainly because there isn't a dub stage. There isn't really a final stage that you're sending to, to mix that is costing thousands of dollars an hour. It's, um, it's usually going to an editing bay of some kind at one of the major video game production offices and then if they don't like something and they want to change, they call you and you make some changes and you send it back. It's a little more laid back, a little more like maybe making a record or something like that, where you've, you're obviously trying to get it done fast, but you don't, nobody's head gets cut off if it isn't delivered uh, at 9 a.m. Um, so yeah, working on, like with, with God of War, you know, that was my part of the process. My mixing part of the process on that was, um, a year. It was exactly a year uh, for mixing that. And I mixed uh, three hours of music for the latest God of War. And there was there was other music too. There was music that came in from the earlier uh, iterations and and uh, and from other places and, and music that was, you know, tavern music and things like that. That stuff that was, you know, mixed elsewhere. But um, the pandemic had a little bit to do with the schedule on that too, because we did actually stop at one point because of um, uh, VFX had to, I think, catch up at, at one point because of resources that weren't available because of the pandemic. There was a couple of things that slowed it down a little bit, but generally it was pretty, you know, full pace, full on for about a year for me where I, I would mix an hour, which took about two months, and then I would take about a month off and then mix another hour, which would take a few months and just kind of keep coming back to it. So yeah, it's uh, it kind of it just really depends on on the type of the project, but but video games generally have a, a bit of a different pace than yeah. than film and TV is even shorter. I mean, you know, for, oh, a single episode of TV, which could be maybe thirty minutes of music, is something we have to turn around in in two days. Uh, right. Well, yeah, with the same kind of stress of deadline is like you know you have to have this turned in by nine a.m. and so a lot of it comes down to you know strategical planning and, and and in my case when I'm doing a number of these successively I have a staff of you know three or four guys who help me because the again the, the schedule is what kind of dictates my my needs as far as how am I going to get this done yeah I could get it done by myself if I had four days but I don't so I have guys who work for me so it's just a different structure you know so this is really good because um, we've done a bit of a cold open here and just gone straight into some discussion about the technicalities of the job. And um, people who, um, it, it, it's interesting to note that almost all of what we've been talking about is scheduling. And to people who are interested in getting into this kind of work, by which I mean, Jason, uh, creative work and specifically in the domain of sound engineering and music production. Um, yeah people might be surprised to learn that the majority of the um, problems that occupy people are not 
necessarily problems about the craft and about the art, but mostly about the discipline that surrounds it, about the scheduling and about the, the you know, the organization of the business, about budgeting things properly. That um, over the last six years, uh, which is how long, you know, I've been in my business trying to learn um, from first principles. Uh, that really surprised me that the the majority of the the majority of the things that were necessary to learn were all about just d- about about the discipline of business and so I'd like to get into in, in not in a short while the the difference between film and video game I think that's a very interesting subject particularly with what we're about to see over the next decade or so with the explosion of capacity and like possibility with the new creative yeah. tools we have yeah. but first I think people need uh, and then there are other places they can hear this but it'd be good to get a bit of a sense of um, why you're doing what you're doing and why you ended up where you ended up because we kind of it's it's important to understand that before we know where you're going and and um, you have a trajectory that I'm quite sympathetic with because I was uh, in a rock band and then that fell apart and then I had to get I, I got into media scoring and I get the impression that your story is somewhat similar but different so what why don't you just take us through briefly the beginning of your your career and what bizarre twists of fate pointed you in this direction? Well, yeah, I mean, I I first and foremost wanted to just be in a rock band and and I didn't necessarily know whether that meant touring or making records or what it was, but I wanted to make records and be and do the creative side of music, and yeah. um, and I was doing that uh, in you know, in a, in a small capacity, we were just playing local shows. And, um, you know, I just, the way you do in Los Angeles, you meet people and, and, uh, a friend of mine who was in a local band was working for a film composer and was leaving the job and said, do you want to meet this guy and see if it might be a job fit for you? I didn't obviously have a job. I was 18, but I was looking for something to get my foot in the door with, uh, some sort of a studio job because I didn't, I didn't really want to go. If there was a way I could avoid going to school for it, I would have been really happy. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> because I wanted to focus mainly on 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 being in a band. And I didn't want to take, you know, the year and a half to to leave that to go do something else. So I took the opportunity, obviously, to meet um this composer, and that was Mark Isham, who I ended up actually getting an internship with and then eventually a job with for um six years. So I, I sort of fell into that, um, you know, sort of haphazardly and, and not very prepared. Um, and, you know, was really still focused on touring and f- focused on making records. So even though I sort of landed this really cool studio job in, in music for post, I was, I was really not uh, certain that was kind of my path. So I went and, and toured full time for uh, from 2003 till 2009, I toured about nine to 10 months out of the year. And it was, it was really exciting. Of course, at first it was like such a different pace and a different, you know, anybody who's toured knows that it is, uh, it is like no other thing in experience. And unless you've done it, it's really hard to describe to somebody. And, um, you know, what I found ultimately was that I, you know, I was, I was in the underground punk scene. So that, that was a, you know, I think for me felt like there was a, a little bit of a shelf life to that. And, uh, and I loved it. You know, I got to, you know, we toured and worked with Flogging Molly and Bad Religion and, and even, you know, Rage Against the Machine and, and all kinds of incredible bands that were all our, you know, growing up were our idols. I was a skateboarder. So all these bands were, you know, in my <laughs> whatever CD booklet or whatever I had at the time, you know, was this, this was my, you know, catalog of, of music yeah. growing up. Um, and, and then there was a sort of a, a little bit of a shift for me. You know, I, I had gotten married and kind of was like, well, you know, where does this go for me? You know, I'm, I'm in my twenties now, but what happens when I'm in my forties? Am I still going to want to be crowd surfing, uh, yeah. you know, and, and, and not sleeping, you know, every day. Uh, I think we should perhaps like put, just uh, dwell on that for a, for a small moment because I think it's a it's an anxiety certainly that that it's an, it's an anxiety that tortured me when I was in a band and I couldn't get my you know my bandmates to 
get as agitated about it as I was. And this is a, this is a this is an issue of being afraid of the right thing. I was kind of they were saying, ah, oh, we don't need to sell records. Making money is evil. We don't need to try and become you know uh, famous, let's say, or notorious because that's just egotistical. Trying to get people's attention like that. We should just do it because we love the music. And I was like, that's cool. But guys, if we don't sell records and no one wants to come, we don't get to do this, and yeah. we have to go and get other jobs. And so yeah. you. You experienced that shelf life. It is a young man's game in some it, sense, it is. or is it I mean, not? There, I mean, I guess there's a pressure. It depends on how you want to look at it. You know, we were on an indie label and there were other bands that were, uh, you know, doing really well. Um, some some had their, their, their coming and going and some, you know, kept going. And, you know, I was at a crossroads where, you know, we were doing it for you know, six years at that point, we're touring for six years. We had actually been a band for longer. And, um, you know, I thought this is, you know, this, this could be, this is a long road ultimately when you're doing a punk band and, and, and it is the slow burn, you know, it's like, this is not an overnight success thing and it's not the way to look at it. And I, I, I really kind of, I have that discipline of like, you know, I take things really, really seriously when I do them. And when I was doing that, I was definitely the driver of the band in in terms of those kinds of things that they didn't want to think about. You know, like let's sell records, let's let's get out there and then like walk up to people and make them listen to our CD and buy it. And we did those things. I I was like, you know, really kind of thinking, let's let's just push this. If we're here, let's not sit around drinking beers. Let's go and and do yeah. This is work. work. Yeah, this is work. And, um, you know, I kind of felt like I didn't feel like I was the only one, but it's sometimes I did. And I sort of felt like if I am the only one this passionate about it, uh, you know, I may find myself uh, uh, having to sort of lower my standards and and way of thinking in order to stay in in this band or, or in this genre or whatever. And I just sort of started to think outside of what I was doing. And, and, I, and I had been working in post leading up to touring full time. And so that job kind of still lingered and, and still existed And my relationship with Mark Isham still existed. So when I decided to sort of slow down on the touring and, and work on getting a studio career, um, he and I reconnected and I, I mixed a couple of of movies for him. I mixed some stuff like I mixed um, a movie called The Crazies, which was this cool little horror movie. And, uh, you know, we kind of started to reconnect and hit it off. And then I just started getting these calls. You know, I started getting calls from just other random composers. And then I was busy in Los Angeles and not able to tour as much. And then, you know, the, 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 everything sort of tilted back the other way. And, Slow, it was again, it was just a slow thing. Like I didn't, I found, found myself having to say no to tours because I was like, I'm busy mixing this movie or I'm busy having to go and record something, you know, somewhere. And, and then I just decided that was kind of where I was going to go. I couldn't really do both anymore. I was trying to do yeah. both for a really long time. And, uh, and was there just, a tension there? Was that kind of pulling on you? Totally. Yeah. I mean, I was really sort of feeling like, again, because I feel very dedicated to things and when I do them, I want to do them hundred percent. I didn't feel ethically that it was working for me to try and still be this rock guy and also stay committed to a very strict profession of like, you know, if you're going to be available for somebody, you kind of have to always be available for that person. Otherwise you lose a client and it's a weird cutthroat world. And in, um, it's that way in, in music too, where like if someone asks you to do a tour and you say no, you don't usually get called to do a tour again. You know, that's that's kind of the last time you get called. So I couldn't really do both because there were just too many schedule impossibilities. And then at a certain point, I just sort of found myself going, fuck it, this is it. I'm just, I'm going full in. I'm going to get myself a studio. I'm going to just call myself this, see where it yeah. goes, you know? <laughs> 
And, so uh, there's a there's a couple of really strong themes that come through there, and one of them is is commitment. You kind of at some point had to notice that like reality was calling you to pick a direction. You could no longer be splitting yourself across both of them, and. You, you know, you kind of have to make a choice, even though it appears to be choosing you. It's like, okay, I am one hundred percent committed to this. I'm no longer being pulled in two directions. Was that was that was that a painful was there was that a painful moment to let go of punk rock? Oh, huge, huge! It was very painful because, you know, there is a little bit of. I'm not going to lie. There is that sense of I don't know if it's ego or that there's that sense of of. Uh, of you get feel high from it, you know, where yeah. you play shows and you do that culture and you do that lifestyle. It's really fucking cool, you yeah. know, and to go and travel to Europe and travel around the world and have people come up to you, uh, not even necessarily even at shows, but just somewhere on the street and they say they want your autograph or something. That's really cool. But it's not even the point of it really either. The culture is not, it's not about you. It's about you know, what, what your message is and, 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 and what you can do to help, you know, people who uh, emotionally have, you know, a lot of frustration and, and need to get that out. So I don't even know that it was really a, a good thing for me that I, I felt really like I needed that and that I wanted that and that to let go of it was, was uh, a bad thing because it wasn't it was a good thing and doing this job is the opposite you know you are not you are not important <laughs> it's in a lot of ways yeah. you know you're you're servicing somebody and you're servicing um you're servicing something that um doesn't doesn't care about your feelings and it doesn't care about uh whether or not you thought that mix was really great because you're going to do it all over again and it wasn't yeah. right so, you know, you're completely swallowing your ego and, you know, your, your own pride and it's a totally different mentality. And it was very hard for me to really get that. I still don't feel like I have the skill of, of fully being able to service people without any, a bit of swallowing of my pride, but I do, I do my best with it. And I do like that, um, to some degree, I actually like that mentality. You know, there's the, all of us are, you know, we're just here to serve whatever the, the job is, you know, it's a job service and it, it's, and it's, yes, it's creative. It's fucking takes a lot of creativity to, to be good at it. But at the end of the day, you're, um, you know, you've got to make somebody else happy. You know. Yeah, and I think it's it's really important to put a pin in something really significant there because there may be there may be people listening to this, hopefully, um, people listening to this who will be in, in a similar spiritual crisis where they're saying, should I leave my sort of, my, let's say, my adolescent exciting passion that has all of the what trappings of youth associated with it, you know, so high emotion, attention, and you know, re like just it, it, incredibly exciting adventure and their impression may be that you have to give that up for a, effectively a day job or an office job, right? <laughs> but it's not its not surprising that you were successful when you were in the band that you were in because you framed it as not being about you. It's not a choice about it. It's not a choice between it being about you or serving someone else's music because when you were in the band, you still referred to it as serving the audience. And I've always had a feeling the better bands and music artists don't think they're serving their creative spirit. They think they're serving the audience they're performing to. Yeah, I think the the best ones I think show that by example and 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 I think that's the reason why uh, I think certain bands don't become as successful as they could. I think that's why we didn't become as successful as we could have been is because I did to some degree feel like I I I wanted it to be a little bit about me, you know, and I wanted certain things to be about me and unless you can really learn that, I don't even know if you can learn that skill. I feel like it's something you just are, you know. I feel like I don't know, like, like Kurt Cobain, maybe, maybe he had an ego. Maybe he was somebody who felt like, uh, he liked being a rock star, but he didn't, he didn't come across that way. And he certainly, he didn't project that in his interviews and the things he said, it was, it, it felt a lot more like he, he felt deep down inside that he just had something to get across and people to need to relate with. And that was what was, you know, 
his passion more than anything else. And he didn't even want to be a rock star. Yeah. Uh, and I think he said in his suicide note that he felt bad that he couldn't connect with an audience the way Freddie Mercury could, like feel like he was in a relationship with them that way. Exactly. Exactly. I think if you are really passionate about the relationship with people, getting them to feel uh, some sort of a lift, that's the, those are the people that become the true uh, stars in in this world and become the the highest in their art form and you know i think that um that just you know wasn't something i could really yeah it was like one of those things where i was like got on stage and you feel like really high and stoked to be in front of thousands of people and that's great but that isn't the point you know the point is that you have you have something that uh, you know drives you to connect with people and make them feel something and it has nothing to do with what you feel you know it has to do with projecting something to to somebody else to make them feel it listen it's not to say that this this job is all you know unfun and deadlines and all that sort of thing this is this is a really fun can be a very fun world you know post production is always pushing the boundaries of 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 creativity and and where it can go and what the future of sound is and can be. Yes. So that's um, you know that is that is reason why I think it's really exciting. You know because I think that there's there's a there's like a fifty fifty of technical and creative, and um, you know I think that's. I think that's really cool. I'm not a, a hugely technical guy. I'm I'm actually more on. I feel like I I lean more to the creative brain. So I I like that uh, balance. You know, I feel like it's a good balance for me. Right, and that's so that that explains why uh, the you making the move from uh, punk rock, um, what let's just say star, to film score specifically mix engineer, not even composer. Um, you know, let's talk about that migration because obviously we've already covered the fact that it it, it came as a result of increasing uh, family pressure. You know, you have to maybe commit to something that exists in one place instead of touring all over the place. That's a great decision to make. Um, but also the discipline that you talked about, with, you know, with serving someone else and having to let your own ego go. And in some sense... Uh, maybe this has been your experience being a father. I'm not a father yet, so I can't comment. But people say there's a great relief in the fact that you're not the most important person, that you have someone else to kind of look out for and care for. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I mean, yeah, that does teach you that uh, immediately. I mean, it's the first day when you have to be up at 3 a.m. to to uh, you know bounce him back to sleep. I, I realized that immediately and it didn't yeah. stop. <laughs> and so, but it's, it's, it's a, but it's a similar move, right? A parallel move across into post-production. You're like, okay, this isn't my music. It's not about me satisfying me. I'm now at your service. And how can I make this, you know, how can I make this work? So, yeah. Uh, yeah. It may seem, I, it may be a bit of a stretch to connect them, but. Well, no, but you know, listen, it's, it's, there's a subtle, but very important uh, skill in that you you have to learn uh, and I still feel like I learn every day how to listen to the client and realize yes. that what the client is saying is really fucking important and what that might be doing to crush your thoughts and ideas uh you have to put the weight on the other side. You have to yeah. think, realize that that you have to, you know, put something up, a mix or whatever, as an idea that can be just literally stepped and leveled. You know, yeah. like <laughs> you know, you've put ten minutes into making this this breakfast for a child who is just going to probably throw half of it on, on the floor, you know, and not give a fuck about how long it took you to make it. And that's the same thing with, with mixing, you know, and, um, but you know, at, at the, at the same time, it's great when it doesn't happen to where you don't have mixed notes. You don't have anybody crushing your ideas. You have somebody say, that's really fucking good. And yeah. I totally love that. And 
the caveat to that is, you know, that will sometimes boost your ego and make you think you're really, really good. And then you might do the next project that might be paying you half the amount you just got paid when everybody loved your mix. And they say, well, we don't like this and we'd like to take the next 10 hours to change it. You have to shift that and you have to realize that, yes, you did a great job on your lap and maybe you even won an award or something. Doesn't matter. You know what I mean? You have to, you have to like reset and you have to say, this is your client. Doesn't matter how much you're getting paid. Doesn't have, matter how much you might be more successful than that person or whatever. It is you have to level the playing field each time and start over. Uh, I have to learn this all the time because I I don't always do it as well as I know that I could. Uh, I every project teaches me something new, and and sometimes I relearn the same mistakes uh, that I've made in the past. You know. Yeah, absolutely. Who? Do you feel like you are serving the composer's vision for how the music should sound or the client? And in in your context, maybe just elaborate a little bit on who the client is, because obviously in my world, advertising, you have two levels. You've got the creative agency making the ad, effectively the film studio, but then behind them, you've got a brand who have to spend, like you said, thousands and thousands of dollars an hour to get the thing made. So really, yeah. it's them that counts. Who yeah. is it in your life? Well, in video games... Um you know, like with, with God of War, we had, I had the composer who was somebody I was serving, but I also had the producers of the music who I was serving, uh, who were on behalf of Sony. So there was actually a two tiered approval process and I had to get the composer to say, okay, make these changes, blah, blah, blah. Fine. Okay. Now we send it to the producers, which is a team of people. It's like six people. So um, you know, in the case of, of that project, it was, it was, a a lot of, you know, people who weighed in on their thoughts. Uh, but a lot of the time with, with films, um, it's usually one creative. It's, it's a lot of the time, um, it would be the composer, but every once in a while, um, there is a, a, you know, two sometimes there's that's two people i mean i guess i've i've made um a number of scores with two composers so sometimes it's two composers uh which is anytime it's more than one person is always a little interesting because uh you know it's either how do you do that do you do them both at the same time do you get everybody in the room together and you sort of hash it out or do you send it to one person get their ideas and send it to another and get theirs uh tends to not work very well in series tends to work a lot better in parallel if you can get everybody together yeah um so a lot of the time it's the composer but like there's just different it depends on who the company is depends on who the studio is and it depends on what the type of project is tv there's usually no time for more than one person's notes uh so it's usually just the composer um but with film you know if uh, if the composer is busy on something else, he might put some of his other uh, assistants uh, on the uh, the email chain or in the studio with me or on Zoom to kind of cover notes. Uh, you know, it varies, and I I think it sometimes is a little uncomfortable depending on who it is or how. Yeah. If, you're, if you're dealing with somebody who you're not familiar with, when you thought you were going to deal with the composer who you're really familiar with, but you're dealing with. Uh, a producer or or their assistant or something like that is not quite as fun. Yeah. Uh, but again, it's one of these things where you just have to learn to adjust to those kinds of things. And and you know, it's usually the creative artist which is the best option. And sometimes it's not. Sometimes it's people who are just money people or producers who are above the creatives. And you know, you have to do what you yeah. have to do. It. Yeah, because often in a, a situation like that, a you know, when we're doing sound design, a creative might have um, several ideas for how to create just a non-specific sound effect. And it might be actually interesting and entertaining to go through those paths with them, right? And yeah. when that task gets handed off to a producer, usually in our world, they're just communicating bullet points via email. They want to hear, you know, let's just to disambiguate a non-specific sound effect. I really want to hear an explosion, you know? Uh, the producer will be like, yeah, I need an explosion. Okay, that's a, that's cool, that's an explosion, move on. You know, so it, it's some often more about satisfying, you know, deadline and budget if I'm working with the producer, whereas creative, it's about satisfying vision and artistry. Is it a similar split in your world or? Yeah, I mean, 
I think like like in when we did the Lord of the Rings Rings of Power show, that was uh one of the interesting things about that is uh is is the demo, which we haven't really talked about yet. In 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 film music, um the the demo or what we call like the mock up that the composer makes uh tends to be what everybody uh in the producing side and everybody in the post production mixing side tends to consider somewhat of a gospel to some degree in terms of where it's at by the time it's approved by the composer can't always can't really vary very much from from where it ended up so even though you're going to replace <laughs> all the orchestra all the soloists the vocals the choir and everything you still have to make it sound pretty close to this only better so for the, uh, the layman the, the mock-up is a kind of digital midi impression of a real score right created really entirely exactly. in the box exactly entirely in the box so you will have things like you know bagpipe solos fiddle solos uh flute solos you'll have uh entire string sections brass sections wind sections choir singing lyrics wrong lyrics because mm -hmm. it's mumbly gook uh yeah. and all this stuff and it's all midi uh so like with lord of the rings that was all midi uh but really great sounding demos but then when they recorded it all all the choir for instance was then all various languages and lyrics and things that were not in the mock-up so you had this fine balance between it's changed significantly in terms of the content syllables and words and and, and even a little bit of the tone yet you, we have to have the same volume graph and dynamic graph and and also uh stage in terms of depth of the field um yet we're completely erasing the MIDI choir and we're putting in this new choir. So there's a lot of detail that has to go into matching that. Yeah. Um, and in my case on this show, uh, I only had to uh, deal with the composer for approval on that. And, and, and almost, I would say, almost 10 times out of 10, we didn't get anybody else to interject or say anything once it got to the dub stage in the final mix that they needed something done again or, or redone. It was, it was usually considered by everybody fantastic as long as, you know, we made it the sound the way we wanted. Um, so in, in the case of a show like that, um, that was, that was kind of, that's the balance I like, you know, where I can have a really great mock-up a really great demo to match first and then take it a little bit further and get it to sound really big really expensive you know put it in five one put it in seven ones make it sound surround and then say what do you think of this and then it's from there it's just like fine-tuning notes but not this like let's rethink this let's start over uh, so a great mock-up and a great demo really helps in that regard and um you know, so anyway, just to answer your question, I, I, that's that's the way, I, that's my sort of preferred way of working is like just directly with one person, and of course taking in mind what everybody wants. But when the mock-up is really good, when the demo is really good, we know that as long as we get really, really close to that, and then take it a step further, everyone's going to be happy down the line because everyone's heard the mock-up, everyone's heard the demo, and this is just going to be a better version of it. Now that's really encouraging that for rings of power you it sounds like you just had a direct one-to-one -one relationship with bear mccreary yeah exactly exactly now that's good because you're working with the composer i just have to draw people's attention for those who aren't familiar with working in the world of media composition that a lot of people will develop a like a a very very strong adhesion to the mock-up and before that, often the temp track. And it's yeah. very difficult to get people to accept a new iteration of music they've already been listening to. For one reason or another, more than other aspects of filmmaking, as far as I've been, been able to experience, people cannot 
like get divorced from music that they are used to. They can see a grade and see that it looks better than the offline edit. And that's cool. They can hear a mix and it's not like the demo and they hate it and they hate how different it is from the temp track. It, I presume that's less the case with someone like Bear McCreary because he knows it's going to go through these stages and trusts you to get it there. But how difficult can it be to get people unglued from the, either the temp track or the mock-up? Man, that's a really good question. You know, certain composers, if we're just talking about composers and, and music for post, uh, don't really put much work into their demos at all. So when it comes to me, I'm almost kind of producing to some degree uh, aspects of the score, like how it's going to sound and and even how much of this music is actually going to stay here. Maybe we're going to weed half of this out of it. And that... Uh, so that's a really different, like, 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 um, like with Nick Urata is a composer. He did uh, the music for Paddington and I worked with him on Paddington and, um, you know, there was a lot of, a lot of music that in the mock-up actually was, was pretty close to how it ended up sounding. But there was, there was a couple of cases where the music did have to be fully realized in the mix. You know, there was a lot kind of thrown at, um, a cue or a particular scene that uh, was going to need some finessing and some changing. So in that case, uh, he he and some of the other composers kind of embraced the idea that mixing is going to be this sort of like fun, exciting uh, pr production type phase of the score, uh, which is not kind just of balancing. Rare. Yeah, yeah. There's not just balancing and not just matching things to a demo or a mock-up, but like now we've got all these elements and now that we've got the picture and now we've got all this, now let's sort of like think about what we really want to do with this. We were just kind of throwing everything at the wall to get it approved, but now let's kind of give this thing some some shape and some body. So that's a different approach. But with Bear McCreary and, and composers like him, he's very methodical and he's he's like, you know, I'm going to make this demo sound pretty much exactly how I want the final to sound. So as long as you have a good ear to how to get there with all of this live material, you're going to be really, really close. Um, <clears throat> so that's, you know, I wouldn't say it's paint my numbers because it really is a, a pretty difficult task. But, but, but the nice thing about that is, you know, you know, you're 90% of the way there as long as you can match it. So, um, you know, there, it's cool when when there are people who can sort of let that go, but there's definitely a lot of marriage to the demo, especially if it's been finding its way around the film for a long time. And yeah. the director will say, you know, I don't care that this solo sounds better or that you had somebody famous play it. I liked your fake version and I don't think it sounds better. <laughs> Which sucks, you know, because yeah. you find yourself sometimes muting performances by some of the most fantastic players around the world, and um, in favor of of demoitis, basically, you know, people yeah. get people get really, really married to the demo sometimes, and, and that's not that you can control, you know. It just yeah. happens. <laughs> happens all it's, worth, the time. it's worth mentioning as an aside as well. There are some savvy soloists who perhaps were fortunate to do the right thing at the right time or perhaps saw exactly the phenomenon that you just described coming down the road and so soloists like Tina Guo have become yeah. the go the go to VST for cello and i i hear it all the time you know you you can hear Tina Guo on someone's youtube video or on someone's trailer and of course some people use the real Tina like uh, Chris Bin Hans who i just spoke to recently for Minecraft um so do you find that you get that kind of thing? For example, you're like, this is the VST everyone uses for this solo, and I keep having to just leave it in there because the director likes it. <laughs> yeah. Uh, well, it's funny, actually. We just used... Uh, we had worked with Tina on Boston Strangler, uh, this movie we did for Hulu. And uh, there was... I, you know, to be honest, I actually don't, I don't know that we did really, uh, use any of, of, of the fake cello, but there was a couple of moments where, uh, you know, th yeah, the director really liked, did really like certain things in the demo phase. And even though we went through the trouble to make, uh, 
all of these fantastic mixes with the orchestra from Skywalker and Tina Guo playing cello and stuff. He, there was certain moments where he really liked the demo, which was all MIDI. <laughs> you yeah. know, um, but that's, you know, that isn't that isn't always the case. But yeah, as you say, it, it can be. And when you have samples of somebody that, yeah, there's I guess that's kind of cool because then you're kind of you're kind of in the score regardless of whether or not you're <laughs> live. It's a, it's live a very good chess move. Yeah, yeah, it is a good chess move. Uh, it, there's, you know, there's no, there's all all of your good intentions uh, to make something, uh, hand you know, to hand somebody something on the silver platter and give somebody the score that they want uh, can still, you know, end up in the bin sometimes. You know. Yeah. Do uh, you um do you have the sense that um. I've noticed that no one, even you know, we. It's very tempting to be, get to develop this sense that we are the music people, so we know all the music decisions and know or know all the best ones, and we are going to tell our clients what the best music decisions are, mm-hmm. and they don't want. I've noticed they do not want to arrive to something finished. They want to be there when it gets assembled. They want to be part of the process. They want to have some input. So, do you make sure there's always space for them to have input? Hmm. No, <laughs> I think I think sometimes when the director is involved in the music mix, uh, you know, it could it could be. I think it could be a little bit dangerous sometimes. Part, actually, one thing that I think is is better a better way of saying it is that you know when we when we record the music, director is always there, producers are always there, and I think that's actually really great to to weigh in on on final decisions in terms of how things get recorded. Um, but I think when it comes to the mixing side, the better way, in my opinion, a lot of the time is let us mix it, send it to you on the dub stage with the dubbing mixer, with you know the final dialogue and you've got your big theater and listen to it there and make your decision there. Because listening to it in here with me in my mix room is going to tell you something, yes, but it's not going to tell you the full picture. And and that is ultimately what you're interested in is the final scope and final picture. So um, a a lot of the time I try and recommend that. Uh, And and it's usually the, the... the directors that that typically want to be involved in the music mix, a lot of the time are first time directors. Um, they're they're directors who haven't done the process with having a you know quote unquote score proper score mixer, um, and so they feel like they they you know they're obligated to have to do this, and and they aren't really. And so a lot of the times, if it's if it's somebody who's done a number of films they don't they don't usually care they say good send it to me on the stage and we'll yeah. have steps we can do what we need to with it that tends to be the traditional process uh but i've had directors here and it's gone well actually most of the time it goes well i even had uh there was a show we were working on with dr dre uh nice. and dr dre came here uh which was i mean i was so nerve-wracked before he came in here because i thought man if this guy hates it uh, they're of course, you know, the other producers who are in the room, of course, are going to say they hate it because they're going to say whatever Dr. Dre says. You and know? there's also a sense that Dr. Dre might be able to do it better because he's one of the super producers of our time. Yeah, yeah, yeah. he's and he, exactly. I mean, I'm like, you're a god, you know. Um, and what was funny is he, he came in and 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 uh, he's like, he's like, man, he's like, all right, that's good. And I okay. Thought, uh, the sense of relief was like it just absolutely so heavy, and um, you know, and I was like, okay, well that that turned out well. It could have gone the other way and didn't. And I'm always that sense of dread when when a director comes in here is like, these guys can fucking squish me if they want. They could just yeah. end me if they want to. So if I don't do them justice and I don't give them what they want it could really be an uncomfortable situation. And I, you know, luckily haven't had that happen yet, knock on wood. But, uh, you know, it, I do definitely feel like every time it happens, when I know a director has to come in, I get really, really nervous. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. It's possible. It's, it's always possible for the person who is 
a, to, who doesn't really answer to anyone to become a tyrant and it's tempting to act like a tyrant because that can be momentarily satisfying but my sense is that the best let's you know generic creative director that might be a film director it might be you know record producer who's looking after a whole album the best ones are the ones who um let's say w- hire certain people because they like the work that they produce, not they like manipulating them to produce their vision. I've heard that Martin Scorsese is like that from um, Michael Imperioli uh, from um, The Sopranos and Goodfellas. He said Martin Scorsese, you know, often, and I'm sure this is a narrow, there's more to it than this, uh, will say, you know, I I have you, you in this character because I thought you would do something interesting with it. So just take it away, see where it goes. I want to see what you do. Do you get people like that, directors like that working with you? Yeah. And, uh, you know, I think it's nice. I think it's nice when you have directors who kind of let let the music world do the music world and 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 not put too much of their own uh, music knowledge uh, imprint on what yeah. on what we're trying to do. But, um, you know, I'm not going to lie. I think I think that I'll, there is. There's to some to some degree there's going to be a little bit of that where they where where the director wants to have uh, some sort of part in it even if they don't really f- fit in in, yeah. in saying something about it because like you said they can say whatever they want they can they can ultimately uh, override you even if you've written some fantastic piece of music but like. Um, you know, like like David O. Russell, for instance, who worked with him on um, on Joy, uh, J- Jennifer Lawrence movie, and you know he was um, he was incredibly hands on, and, and some of it, not maybe not all of it, but there was there was a there was definitely um, you know an aspect to it that was that was very hands on, where it was like you know. These are all fantastic pieces of music. These all serve fantastic as music, but but obviously, what's what's in his head is something specific, and that maybe he can't convey. So he was very involved in some of it. Um, in fact, I have uh, some really funny phone calls of him basically uh, in a recording session with us on the phone. He wasn't actually in person, and um, <clears throat> we just we just went for. I don't even know for like an hour, just trying out diff- different eight bar phrases and how to d- play them. Uh, I think at one point he said that he wanted something to sound like candy. And I don't, I don't even know what that means. I don't know what candy mm. is sonically, you know? Yeah. And that can be maybe, the most interesting. Fab filter. Actually, I kind of think, I think fab filter might be candy. I think of fab filter with all those colors and everything. Well, you mean so you think of the like, entire Fab Filter suite, or just the the Q3, or what? <laughs> no, the 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 Pro Q3. Yeah, I'm the thinking. Pro Q3. Show, I'm showing the fact that I don't use Fab Filter. I'm a Waves guy. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> am I misnaming okay. it there? Good. Yeah. I'm actually, to be honest, I'm sick of people constantly telling me, "Well, you should put a Pro Q3 on it," you know, because it looks cool. You know. Yeah, and is it, is, is it is it a dynamic EQ as well? It responds to the incoming signal. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And I've, I'm not going to lie, I've actually started to use it quite a bit for that purpose. I, I, I bought it a long time ago, and I never really used it. And just sort of over the last few months, it has started to creep in more and more <laughs> for dynamic control as an EQ. And, you know, I'm not going to lie, it definitely looks cool. It, it does sound good. But it's one of those, I feel annoying tools because everybody sort of uses it and people who don't necessarily know how to use it use it and anyway well we i mean in my d- what was that no i was just was saying we tried to make it sound like candy for david o russell and, and that was that was that and that i thought pro q3 probably would have i presume david o russell wasn't one of the people asking for the pro q3 <laughs> no <laughs> <laughs> No, this is this was a purely creative discussion. But if, yeah, I, if I were being asked to make something sound like candy, I would I would put that up and see what what the client said. Absolutely, it's um, I I don't remember you know VST manufacturers and VST bundles have moments in the spotlight. And when I was at college, 
um, as you call it over in the states. We call it university over here. Um, <laughs> when I was there, we had the the the, the I shouldn't say this the the waves the cracked waves bundle that every student had that was flying around, and so um, um, your first day ever using a digital workstation you had about 400 plugins and so you were like right i suppose i'll just try every different compressor and every different EQ. So you have these 10 stacks of plugins on every single channel you can't make any of them do anything nice and so uh, at least the fab filter has a kind of limitation to it it's like this is an eq this is a limiter just learn to use them <laughs> uh, yeah i mean or don't even put it why do you have to put it on everything like come on like just you know let this thing breathe for a second and then see what you need to do at the end you know like come on Absolutely. that's the thing I, you know i feel like that's a tail sign sometimes of somebody who is uh mixing for for the purpose of mixing you know as you see just plugins on fucking everything and you start to take them all off and you go, well, this sounds really, really good. You know? <laughs> when I, you say mixing for the sake of mixing, do you mean seeing mixing as the art yeah, form, not, not the music? Something, you know what I mean? And seeing, you know, because it's an LA-2A <clears throat> or Waves LA-2A or whatever, that, that you want to see it on everything because you feel like, well, now you're adding some tube color to every track and that's fine. But, if, you know, they probably had one on the way in. Do you need one now again? Like, you know, I don't think you need it on everything. I don't think you need it on a pad, you know? Yeah, I, I, I saw, um, <laughs> I, I, did I, I think it may have, uh, I, I spoke to Andrew Sheps and I can't remember whether he said this on it's irrelevant in some sense on my podcast or on, on something else. He was basically saying if you get you know most of the sexy plugins that people like Waves do are just analog emulation. Not they're just that they're not just that. But what I'm saying is there's a lot of that. There's a lot of Neve emulation, a lot of SSL, a lot of LA two A, a lot of. And he said basically if you fall in love with one and put it on everything, your whole mix just sounds like a slightly broken Neve. You know, it's just a because that's what harmonic distortion and analog color is. It's being slightly broken. So if you do that on everything, there's no contrast. There's no variety in color. Everything's just one, yeah, one texture, one color. One texture, yeah, <laughs> sure. I mean, <clears throat> but it's also kind of cool sometimes to put, you know, one type of console on the whole mix and make it sound like an old analog mix in that regard too sometimes. Uh, but yeah, I agree with you. I think it's, you know, it, you can you can homogenize something in the wrong direction, you know, because people yes. think that... Because people think it's digital, it needs some sort of color added to it. But, you know, if you just listen to the mix and see what it needs with your eyes closed, you might do something yep. different. <laughs> well, it's like, you, re you know, in the, remember in the early 80s when particularly in music from, from my wonderful city, Manchester, you got the Smiths, you got Joy Division making a big impact on the culture. And yeah. the sound, I would argue that the sound of some of those records in the early 80s was too digital and it was extremely cold like the you know the low end had been you know given a kind of um i can't think of an elaborate metaphor but uh sean everett said to said on uh, said to me on this podcast he's like that is the that is what makes that music sound good the way that it sounds good it's a lack of something can be a good thing sometimes and like you said a certain type of homogeneity is a decision, it's a characteristic. So, you know, if everything was just equal representation across the whole frequency spectrum, it, it would just, well, it would all be white noise, really. But you know what I mean? It, everything can't sound the same. You have to have more of something and less of something to have a character. Yeah, sure. I mean, I think to some degree you can't avoid sounding like now, maybe to some degree. I mean, every time... What, that, what is that sound? What's the zeitgeist sound right now? <laughs> um... God, what is the sound for me right now? I mean, I, I feel like, well, in in film music and post production music, you know, video game music, um, I feel like uh, uh, it, it is it is kind of loud. Yes. You know, things are loud right now. You know. Yeah, but not things, loud in a careless way like they were in two thousand and one. Not a kind not, of crushed it, limiter. Yeah, but you know, I think I think with with uh, Atmos, things are louder because they're they're you have a much bigger uh, uh, soundscape places to put things and 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 so things are louder right now, and uh, I like it. I'm excited by it. But I think in ten years we'll sort of look back at the beginning of Atmos and think, you know. 
we were we were just kind of uh excited by it you know yeah, yeah <laughs> you can hear really people excited. playing with the new toy in a given era you can hear all the in the uh, the 60s sergeant pepper era it's like oh we can bounce multiple things onto one tape things now so on yeah. the right speaker all the time things on the left speaker and then and then in the 70s you started to see people coming to their senses and putting the drums in the middle again and it was like yep. yeah yeah and it, it's it's that kind of stuff where you like a kick drum a kick drum does just sort of belong in the center a lot of the time you know uh i don't know that that's that is ever going to be the wrong place to put a kick drum but uh you know maybe 10 years from now we'll start to go fuck what were we doing we were just kind of uh we were going a little bit crazy because we we had this new toy to play with and yeah. uh i don't know that's kind of how i feel like I feel like that's how now is going to be looked at 10 years from now is it's like we were just sort of loud and and boisterous uh in in sort of being freed up by uh the the new medium I guess to some degree. I, th I think you're right that it's there's a lot of, there that though it will be characterized by a type of getting carried away and running a, a long way in one direction because if I look at some of the thank I was born in the 90s and the great thing about the 90s one of the great things about the 90s was there as a revival of the 60s because people who grew up in the 60s turned 30, 35, and started putting their influences back into the culture. And so yeah. we got to watch uh, a great British kids show called Thunderbirds, which was done with marionettes and stuff. And mm -hmm. it was filmed in like extremely vivid high color because that was now possible. And I feel like our music that we've been listening, that we've been experiencing since about 2010 is going to be characterized by its temptation towards extremes. Like it's going to be really saturated, very, very like harmonic distortion, not distortion like crunchy distortion, but everything's got harmonic analog emulation. Everything's very wide, uh, extreme dynamic range, but moving very, very quickly because it's now controlled by digital parameters that can move at milliseconds. I have a feeling it's going to be viewed with that kind of a lens. It's like, whoa, this is all really ott cool it down guys yeah yeah absolutely i think we, we we've got very surgical precision combined with with uh just a just a wide wide soundscape and uh, and i think you know reining it in a little bit is uh probably going to be how we see the change in the future is that 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 things become a little more settled down or maybe that there's there's like a, a less of the the tricks in the bag kind of become a little bit more like, uh, you know, maybe we don't need that. Maybe we don't need that. And this is just sort of like a, a narrowed uh, tool set. I, you know, in general, I actually try and limit myself quite a bit. I don't, I don't, um, you know, I don't buy plugins every two seconds. I have, yep. I have, you know, a, a limited range of plugins that uh, I feel like per one of the big things for me actually that drives me in this is because I used to be, first of all, this is a, I'm going to like nine different tangents, but, but I, my studio is, um, at a building called Fab Factory Studios, uh, which is in Los Angeles. And Dave Pensado used to be here, uh, oh, wow. for years and he was right across the hall from me. And when I moved in, in 2017, he was here and, uh, I used to go and, and hang out with him and he would tell me all about the latest and greatest plugins and I would buy them all. And I was constantly buying plugins and there was another fantastic uh, mixing engineer here as well. He got was, given them for free, by the way, people. That's well, worth noting. I, he actually did he actually did admit that he bought some, which you know, maybe oh, he was doing, but but uh, but good on him if if he was. And I so yeah, I did buy I did buy them and um and I got really into just like well so this week what's the thing to put on the kick drum this week what's the thing to put on uh the bass and that was always changing and and the plug-in thing was just like a bit of a drug habit and so i was really just on that tip for a while and just buying everything and i think it what one good thing that came out of that was that I just started to realize that there's a, a handful of plugins I was always reaching towards and using. And then I started to kind of just use those and actually took a bunch of plugins out of my plugin folder. And unless I was using them constantly, I just took them out of my plugin folder. Like there's no point in having a list of EQs that when you pull up your EQ list, you see uh, 75 EQs. That's impressive. But it, if you're not actually using them, you should probably just take them out of your plugin folder and see what 
happens when you take it away? Are you actually going to be looking for it? And so I started to do that. So for me lately, I have um, I have not purchased a plugin in five months, probably. Mm-hmm. I mean, maybe, maybe I bought one thing because I needed it or whatever. But uh, I, I was buying, you know, a couple plugins a week, um, and I just sort of just realized that for me, I think the 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 sound can actually be a lot better if I just learn some of these really really well and 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 figure out how I can twist and turn these set of plugins to to as far as they can go and make that my sound and so lately that's kind of been my thing you know there's like a handful of plugins I really I've I've had a plugin that I really like that I've had for a long time called Equality from DMG Audio which was kind of I don't know if it predates the Pro Q3, but it was um, a really great, you know, digital uh, parametric EQ with the with the waterfall behind it. And uh, when it came out, I thought it was was really really cool, and I still have it, and I still use it a lot. And I, you know, if I really need to go to something else, I'll go to something else. But I try and uh, limit myself to things that I can just know really really well, and I yeah. and I. I think that plugins. The other thing too about about post production is that if you are putting plugins that are brand new on something, you actually need to take two weeks to burn it in and make sure that there isn't some sort of a bug with the plugin. I won't name a plugin, but there was a plugin that that had just come out that I started putting on uh, every track, and it was an EQ. And we started to wonder why the mixes weren't coming back the same way when we were opening up the sessions again and I was like, what, what the hell is going on? These settings don't look the same, but that must've been how I had it. And then a few weeks later I had emailed the plugin company and I said, is there something up with this plugin? It seems like something's weird with it and I can't figure it out. They're like, Oh yes. Uh, we're putting out a new version of it. It basically doesn't save settings. And so uh, <laughs> I had done, I had done an entire film with this plugin, where my settings weren't coming back the same way, and it, well, on every instance of the plugin, I had a lot of instances of it because it Whoa. was a new. I was really excited about it, and I sadly had it on and everything, and it was not coming back the way I had said it. And I didn't even really pick up on it that that's what was happening until I was done. So I I had sent it out the door that way. And, you know, it's sad, but, you know, these are the kinds of things that... If plugins are great. They're fantastic. They will change your life. But there's a, there is, an, especially in post-production, you have to make sure that these plugins are stable first and foremost. So I don't just jump on plugins and say, let's just get the newest, let's get the greatest. It's like we put it in, we put it into our um, edit room and we just test it out for a couple of weeks. We put it on things, we open closed sessions, we see what it does when, when we put it here. We mono version, a stereo version, a multi-channel version. Is it going to fuck up when we do certain instances of it? Does it hold automation properly? I mean, these things are obviously tested by the company, presumably before they get released. But again, with this plugin, they released it with a, obviously a glaring issue. So uh, that's another reason why I don't just jump on plugins is because for me, I can't have that happen to me on, on something where everybody's like signing off on something and says it's great. And then when you open it up to print it, it doesn't sound the same. Absolutely, yeah. It's worth noting. And for the for the for the for the layman who it, it, it's unlikely that we attract layman listening to this thing, but I know that some of my family occasionally listen to this who aren't familiar with these kind of the kind of terminology we're using. Uh, a, an EQ that doesn't save its settings every time it closes down is kind of like making a painting, but the paint evaporates. So it just all of your work just disappears. Yeah, exactly. It's like uh, you know the the black outline of your picture just like you know remains there. <laughs> Yeah, exactly. And that's it. I mean, I had um, uh, uh, this other project where, oh, yes. So when I won't name the project, but again, similar thing is that we have four, usually actually have like four different rooms or, or, or editing bays or whatever kind of going at the same time where we're working on the same session. And one of the issues too that I've come up with on a technical side is that uh, plug-in version numbers 
really have to be the same between editing rigs and mix rigs because I've had certain plugins uh, lose settings because they went to a newer version of the plugin when I sent it to the editing bay. And then when it came back to me on the mix rig, it was the older version and it lost the settings. Um, so there was a couple plugins that uh, we had that issue with. One of them was uh, uh, Low Ender had that issue at one point where if it was a newer and older version between two uh, computers, it didn't save the setting. So for me, that's in the post world, that's one of the ways I work is I, I'm not the only one who touches the session. I'll send it to an assistant to maybe do uh, a premix of the drums or something like that, or do an edit of something and then send it back to me. And if it's not the same exact uh, version number of certain plugins, we've actually found there's a couple of companies that uh, the versions when they when they go forward they're not backwards compatible. So when yeah. it's a new version of the plugin, so that's another you know big thing for me. Like if I hire somebody temporarily on a project, we go through our entire plugin list, which is exhausting, and we actually just make sure that the versions are the same, so that if we're sharing sessions back and forth, we don't have that issue. And so it's just, a, is it just a case of updating if you find one that isn't, you know, theirs or yours isn't up to date or isn't? Yeah, aligned? yeah, yeah. We figure out who's got the newer one or if somebody can go backwards, Some depending on who it is. Like if 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 it's me who is the one that's out of date, um, you know, I'll try and update. But if it's, if it's, if it's them who's uh, out of date, it depends on like if I have like five different sessions going on and I need the older version. Mm-hmm. I try and see if they can roll back to the older version, uh, just so that I don't lose. Ish- I don't have an issue with the other project I'm mixing. So if I'm mixing two projects at a time, sometimes I don't update. I have the other person go backwards. But generally, we try and obviously move forward with it if we can. Yeah. yeah. And to people who may be out there listening and wondering why would you go to such lengths, it returns to the uh, issue we were discussing at the very mm-hmm. outset, which is that ultimately everything that you can, all the media that you consume, all the entertainment, and there's a lot more of it now than there once was because it's so much easier to produce. And believe me, that uh, what m- uh, multiplication of entertainment assets is only going to increase as we head into the AI era because it becomes easier again to make things. Why am I saying all this? It's important to do all this laborious work that um, Jason is describing because at the end of the day, someone, if you have one problem that sets things back by three days, means they're like 50 grand out of pocket immediately. So, you know, 100%. you've got to get things disciplined and correct. Is, is that right? Yeah, like if you if you have to reprint something that you've already sent to the dub stage, um, say that's just an hour of lost time, that hour of lost time could be $5,000. You know, yeah. uh, when you when you factor in everybody's individual pay and the studio's pay, um, so those are the kinds of things that you know may not seem like a big deal if you're dealing with an artist in in your, their bedroom, but when you're dealing with something that has the kinds of consequences like uh, many thousands of dollars an hour because of a mistake like that, uh, it's the, it's a much bigger uh, consequence. And so for me, those kinds of things are really, really important. You know, we go through like every single plugin and, and, and we don't ever update things unless we make sure everybody does it at the same time. Um, Any time the session is open and being shared between different rigs, uh, that's kind of a big deal. And maybe some people don't think about this kind of thing uh, who are mixing records and, and that sort of thing. But um I do, and and I do know some music mixers who are doing this now too, where they do share sessions between multiple rigs for various reasons, for editing or for printing or something like that. And you, and for me, this is a big part of 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 the job is actually just making sure before you even start the project, we go through and just go, did that computer auto update? Oh. Well, let's, you know, we just check it. You can never assume anything. Like even though we've gone through every single plugin and even every app like Pro Tools and uh, Yukon and all that stuff to make sure that they're the same between all the rigs, we still check it between projects just to make sure something didn't auto update and change because it does cause issues behind the scenes that you don't know are happening. And it totally sucks when you find out two weeks later that you fucked something up. 
<laughs> yeah, it's uh, you're terrible when you realize that there was a hole in the bottom of the hole a somewhere hole that, yeah, and you're actually right. sinking. Because <laughs> sometimes you don't know what's happening. You know, you finish a project, you're done, and you think everything's great. And so these are the kinds of things that keep me up at night. I yeah. don't like it. I don't like it, but it's part of my job. You know, yes. I, have to, I have to just exhaustively scour every possible option of anything that might be screwing me over behind the scenes. You know, software is super powerful, but it has its quirks. Yeah, that's the, I, I haven't, we haven't developed the same level of potential frustration that you're, you're exhibiting there. I think that's because we work at a smaller scale with smaller consequences. <clears throat> I mean, you know, uh, even, even if, uh, even if it's just within one rig and you're working on a laptop, say you, update uh to a new a newer version of a plugin and then you find out that it's not compatible with your intel chip versus the m1 chip or whatever it's like these kinds of things are it's are important on any level you know what i mean it's like yeah. um i i don't just automatically go to the latest software or whatever it's like you know you you do have to think about uh i guess the intel m1 thing and like is this os gonna work and like you know I, tr I actually think my OS is pretty old because I... Do you Which know? one are you on? <laughs> I'm on... Is it Maverick? Is that possible? Maverick? I'll take that. I think it's, I think it's Maverick. You know, because if, if it's working, I, I do not change the OS. Like my phone, I think, is a super old OS too. I just, yeah, I'm, I, I, paid, I paid daily for that once in 2019. I updated my Mac OS and then couldn't use Ableton. And it's like, right, well, there goes my livelihood. So. Right. And actually, back in the day, you mentioned the cracked plugins. I had updated um, to the new Pro Tools and lost everything because I had yeah. a bunch. I had a bunch of cracked stuff that when they went to the, what was it? The 64 bit thing. Right. And yep. then you, you couldn't do that anymore. So it was like, Oh, well, I guess I got to <laughs> pull out the credit card, buy a bunch of stuff. <laughs> yeah. And it's all, it's important to, it's important yeah, to note that <laughs> I'll, I, that, that's, that's gone. The Jason's never worked with anything but fully licensed software, but, um, um, <laughs> It's important for people to note, you know, we're talking about basically the painstaking, um, what the painstaking upkeep that, that, that this job can entail. It's important for people to remember that it's tempting to assume that things just work, but everything, including digital things like software, is in a constant state of decay and needs to be kept up. You know, that's just everything is like that. Analog technology was like that. Digital technology is also like that. And so, you know, it's always tempting to think, well, you know, we moved it onto the digital world. It should just work forever. But this stuff breaks as if it's a car. So it really does. It really does. It's wild. I mean, you know, you are blown away by the sound of it. <clears throat> And it and it is true. It is it is is amazing what we're achieving with AI, but unless it works and it's super super solid, I actually don't care and don't want anything to do with it. So when yeah. something is yeah, when something is like a just an absolute rock of a plugin or a software or an app, then I'm all about it. And those those are because when when you <clears throat> when you're factoring in time, which again is like probably the most important factor. Uh, in post production, um, things that don't work don't matter how good they sound. Yeah, they don't. Uh, if, if if the thing works, then you got to make that sound really good because that's that's a more useful tool than something that works kind of and or or doesn't always come back the same way you had it. It's that's just, it's part. Of the <laughs> it's part it's part of the nature of bargaining reality that we were talking about as well at the very beginning when we were saying you know it's uh you were successful in, uh, in a in a punk rock band to begin with because when you played your music people liked it and ultimately the ones who succeed in that domain are the ones who just accept that that is the acid test if the audience likes it you're doing it right and if they don't like it it doesn't matter how important you think it is or how important it is to you your music is for the audience, you know, so um, it, it's just, we, you know, this is the theme that keeps coming up. You have to test things out against something. And if it works, it works. And if it doesn't work, doesn't matter. Back to square one. And yeah. it's important. To, it's important to be reliable, which is a, a, the reason I'm segueing to reliability is because we're at an hour 25. I'm about to hit my an hour 30 limit and I have to be reliable as well. And do you work on Sundays? Is it a working day for you or have you just come in for this? Oh, yeah, no, I totally work on Sundays. Absolutely. Um, 
you know, uh, it's funny because uh, I was thinking about what you were just saying with regards to the litmus test of of putting up a new song in front of an audience and seeing what they think of it. I think people's a lot of <clears throat> a lot of bands first re- best records oftentimes because you know people, a lot of people say oh, their their best record is their first record is because they played it in front of crowds a lot and changed aspects of their songs based on audience reactions. Yeah, like a comedian uh, testing jokes. Punk records are all about audience reactions. So like bands yeah. that toured the LA circuit uh, for an entire year before they made a record, I'll give you a perfect example, Rage Against the Machine's first record. That, they played those songs for like two years and the album is a carbon copy of their live show. That's all that, that show was just those songs completely fully honed in. You know? The album was recorded live at Sound City, wasn't it, in one like take? That's right. And, yeah. and, and actually they were, they were doing things like pumping a PA system into the room to make it feel like they were playing a live show. Like that's how honed in that record was. And, mm-hmm. and, and you know, if you were to ask Tom Morello, "Hey, try out this this new pedal. It's really cool," he would have been like, "Go fuck yourself. I have what I need. This is my rig. It works, and it's done." Right. So there's a there's a I feel feel like a little bit of a punk rock ethos, but um, you know, I also did some live sound, and live sound had a little bit of that ethos too, where it's like, um, you know, if you had uh, if you had a two week tour. And the first day was dreadful because you had every freaking cable not work and you had, you know, this or that not work. You got it all out of the equation. You changed it until you got it working. And once it was working, you didn't change anything. So when I'm in the studio, I feel a little bit of that punk rock ethos and live sound ethos kind of carries over is like, once I have it working, I like to be able to just go and every day just kind of know that it's a stable rig and that it's going to, uh, come back the same way it was yesterday. And so when I add things, I add things, you know, very cautiously where I'm just like, okay, well, <clears throat> I'm going to just be very suspicious of this thing for about two weeks until it proves to me it's actually working. And, uh, you know, that's just kind of what I grew up learning was like, you know, who used to get these like cables and gear and whatever from like different companies that wanted to like give us shit and try this and whatever. And it would break on stage. I mean, like, you know, I get that it's good or it sounds good or something, you know, the the quality of it's nice, but like you would find out very fast that when you're running around on stage or whatever, the, the elements of life play a much bigger role than maybe the sonic subtleties of something. You know? Yeah, and so the elements of life are, uh, you know, just a much bigger factor to overcome, in my opinion, than you know, uh, sipping, you know, sipping tea and and thinking, oh, how how great does this plugin look? You know, doesn't yeah. matter. Yeah, <laughs> all that matters is all that matters is when you test it against reality and see what comes back. That's right, hard reality. <laughs> hard reality hard like a rock like Jason LaRocca there you go that's the final segue for everyone Find it all in. yeah man can you are you able to talk to people about what you're working on at the moment or are you under like 20 NDAs uh I'm not actually you know what no everybody I maybe everybody made a mistake it didn't make me sign NDAs this month um I nobody made me sign an NDA about the stuff I'm working on right now I'm working on um yeah, the, the the cast album, the Broadway cast album for Sweeney Todd with Josh Groban. And uh, uh, that's coming out later this year, uh, which is a you know different thing for me. Um, uh, that's the Stephen Sondheim Sweeney Todd, is it? It is. It yeah. is. Yeah, yeah. And um, and yeah, it's it, it all all got recorded in New York and, and uh, we're mixing it now and uh, working with uh, Alex Lackmore on that who's, uh, <clears throat> you know, uh, if anyone's familiar with Hamilton, that's uh, uh, one of his most sort of famous productions. And um, he's pretty awesome. I mean, he's he's got an ear like nobody else. And uh, I'm working on a couple of movies. Um, what am I working on? Uh, well, I have, I did some work on Flash that's coming out in a couple of nice. months. Um, and 
a couple other, you know, productions that they don't even really have names right now anyway. So even if I did tell you, you'd just be like, what is that? I don't even get what that is. So, you know, a bunch, bunch of movies and TV shows. And I'm working on some crap just called Untitled Christopher Nolan Film. Who knows exactly, exactly. I guess. No big deal. You know, whatever. <laughs> All the scores just in rewind the whole time. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so it's, it's, it's busy. It's, you know, working on all kinds of really great stuff. But actually the record I'm really excited about because that's, that's kind of different for me and, and, uh, and new in some ways. So um, I'm kind of most excited about that one at the moment. Yeah, well, we'll keep an eye and an ear out for it. It's been it's been a really good uh, over an hour now. Um, so thanks. Oh, for... I'm sorry. I apologize. No, no, don't apologize. I would go for three hours if I could. But usually, you know, I'm not I'm not important enough. This podcast isn't like a Joe Rogan yet, where we can be like, here, you know, we can pay guests and just block out their whole day so we can yeah. talk. You know. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, sure. We'll get there, and when we get there, we'll come over to LA and um, we'll uh, we'll we'll do one in person and get much more technical. But it's been really good, um, and you know, I hope we can uh, do something again sometime. It's usually the way I, usually the way I leave things. So thank you. Of course. Thank you, Greg. Really appreciate it. It was a lot of fun.